Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Art Cast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to occur when one embarks on this adventure of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hey, everyone. I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience designer and a coach of like creative process and all that. And I make interactive stories. How are you doing, Jersey? You're still working on that, uh, that, that, that identification tag. It is what it is. It's, it's the whole like, um, honestly, if someone walks up to our podcast live, like if we were on the street, live on the street, somehow in, within like a fishbowl or whatever, and there was people like, you know, hey, and, and somehow if you could identify people by looking at them like, oh, you're a game developer. All oh, right, you're a product manager. All oh, right, you're user experience designer. Then it's like, I filter what I say as far as my title based on my audience. But the leaners are a wide swath of all sorts of different creative disciplines, a lot of them you know, leaning toward visual storytelling, but you know, we all make stuff and we think about it. And then as far as me professionally, oof, duh, there's just a few ways to, <laughs> a few ways to describe that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. we, we weren't expecting the, the Midwest. <laughs> oh, you got your Midwest on the podcast. I did. Uh, but yes, yes. Saying all of the things right now, and I think, and I was, I was also like shining a light on that because that's basically the topic for this week, right? Is this? Idea it is. Of like, it's kind of funny, like to try to play with that too, where it's like, what am I going to say this time? I don't know. <laughs> kind so. of counts this time because, like, that's the the subject of the episode. Well, actually, no, I would say yeah. that modeling, modeling, fumbling our way through it too is part mm. of uh, figuring out this topic. Of what? Well. Okay, so we usually, for those who are new to the show, we pick a single topic and try to talk about it from a couple different angles, like sort of a what it looks like when we're engaging with the topic and then how we think about engaging with the topic. And then there's a third section of the show now where we talk about like a two-minute practice thing, a thing that we do, an action item to take on for the next week between shows. Um, so that said, what is our topic this week, Rob, before I hit the music to transition us over to that section? Well, I mean, we're talking about our uh, creative identity, and I think that's some kind of combination of like, well, how do you briefly title and describe yourself? And yet there's probably more to go with it. So when someone says, oh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm thinking about working with Jersey, and he, he describes himself as a um, our cartoonist and teaching artist, uh, great what else does that mean that that gives me a signal how do i go further with that and and so that's that's performing a you know the duty of your your um it's a bit of personal brand professional brand what have you creative identity it's all it's all in that like how do we describe what we do for who we want to help mm, that's good how do we describe what we do for who we want to help? And the music means that we are now heading into the first section of the show. To talk about what what does that look like? Uh, how do how do what does it look like when we're engaging with this idea of like defining you know who we are and who we want to help? So, uh, yeah how do how do how do you how how do you whittle at this definition, Rob? Uh, I, th okay. So you could be in, in sort of different situations. And I think we're going to like, for me, I, I have a variety of things I do, obviously welcome to the, the show so far. That's one of the things we we've actually made a playful conversation of it recently where, what am I going to do to say, you know, like, this is my concise title, this episode. Um, and it's, it's, um, like for me, I do a variety of things and, and you do too as well, Jersey. It's just, you have found like a really stable way to, to just, that's the initial thread to pull on. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking for that. So for me, it's like, if we just list like collectively the kind of things that we, we do, it's like, well, um, making comics, especially you, right. Um, mm -hmm. for me, that's been a few years, but it happens sometimes still, uh, teaching, design right so the design as a discipline of um well 
solving problems, placement in context with purpose to, to meet to meet some needs of, a, of an audience using constraints and all that kind of stuff. We had a three-part uh, series that I think um, we could we could link to on that just mm. early in, in our show's uh, history. Um, uh, right. And obviously, yeah, I talked about that quite a bit. We, how do you design if you don't research? Mm -hmm. So research is a big thing. How do, and, and my gosh, you've done tons of research for storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every okay, project. Folks. Every, every yeah. project, even even the make em ups, as Greg Shugel likes to call them, um, hmm. you have to do what? what? The make em ups? Make em ups. You know, well, like that's just a, a cute way of saying like pure fiction, right? Like fantasy fiction, um, for instance. <laughs> To go back to the episode we did last fall where you led me through a coaching session and it was when I was in the middle of working on this Baron Von Bear comic book pitch and I wasn't sure why I was running out of steam on it. And then through the coaching session, you pointed me at like, oh, I need to do more research on this. Research meaning I need to go and look at a whole bunch of books about um, ancient art too because I was trying to design this this statue, this ancient... Um, mystical statue that protects the Baron von Bear's keep of cursed objects, right? And I didn't know what that was going to look like. And I was like, sort of like, just like working from the gut going like, oh, I once saw this article about like these cool old Soviet statues. Maybe I'll base it on that. And I wasn't getting very far with it. And then so after talking with you, I did, uh, you know, I went to the library and I collected a whole bunch of books on like ancient Aztec art, ancient Egyptian art, ancient Greek art. Uh, I even got books of old ghost stories, just like whatever I could gather to help me. Like, you know, I was going through what you described as urgent capture, just like let it wash over me and see what stands out, you know? So yes, even when you're doing stuff where you're just making stuff up, at least for me, there's some, there's some level of uh, research involved in that. And, and so, I mean, and that's like, so some of these things that we do, like for, and for me, like research can be the product. So I can, um, in applying the, you know, so, so like research can power a product and help you navigate a process, but also research can be the point. And it's, it's a, um, it's an outcome to say, well, we needed to learn about something and that's what we're investing in. And, you know, in employing you as a resource, like in, in and so I've provided that, that, um, that role quite a bit where um, True. like what learning, what do we need to learn? What are we trying to decide? And then doing uh, either uh, backward or forward looking research to try to understand more about our constraints and our audience and, and um, to just, you know, make a better product, right? Make it mm -hmm. and, and have it be more meaningful and have stronger ideas, right? Because we can just make this stuff up. So um, uh, facilitation, that's another one. Um, that's, that's a thing where we don't make things alone typically and facilitation can be the product or it can power the product. Like you described your process about working with organizations and being an art advocate and whatnot. You're facilitating all the time to, yeah. to navigate those things. Yeah, for real you are. Yeah. Uh, and even if you are taking your product on the road and demoing it for people or doing a talk about the kinds of services or products that you make. There's a, a level of facilitation that's involved in that. If you want to have an eye on um, keeping it interactive and keeping it being, uh, having it have like a fluidity so that it has maximum uh, utility for whatever audience you're meeting because every audience is different. So you bet. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean you're getting involvement, right? And so that that's when you're your facilitator, you're kind of this this uh, this catalyzing role to to weave uh, purpose and people together to go from somewhere to somewhere, and that can be yeah a sales process or um, getting people involved with something you learned, maybe from research, what have you. I don't this these are building blocks that that can all fit together, and this is um, and it's funny like I think we each have all these building blocks, both Jersey and I, just like for you know, sometimes it's the product <laughs> and other times it's powering and it's behind the scenes and it helps enable the process of making a product. Just, yeah. It's like, what's the client pay paying for? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then there's, there's another one on the list that I think you do a little bit more than I do, which is coding and cause you do game design, you make games. And not not just board games, but like interactive games for you know mobile devices, um, and even made workshops about how to do that. Right, 
So, yeah. So I know I do a little, this has come up where you like, I think a lot of folks, you don't have to identify as any of these things, but you right. may actually end up encountering them and having them in some, uh, playing a minor role. Uh, but yeah, for me, coding has been a, um, like an upfront major component of different, different roles and um, uh, places I've served uh, where, where I've, uh, like one gig I had in recent years, I was very emphatically both a UX designer and an engineer because I would need to be um, switching hats, pro going from design to prototyping and then all of a sudden facilitating tests and all that. So it just depends on, it depends, but yes, yep, coding. Um, it's not typically what I would say, I'm hanging out my shingle and, uh, and I'm emphasizing code for that role as 100% of what I would offer. A given mm -hmm. endeavor but it's there right uh what else and we talked about uh just a moment ago coaching is something that i think you do in a more um explicit way i think it's part of my role as a teaching artist um I mean, I, I would, yes, it's definitely part of my role as a teaching artist, but I mean, I just, I, I understand that that might not be as apparent to anybody who thinks about what it means to be a teaching artist, right? Like, like when, when I'm teaching in a room, like I, I try to avoid as much as possible telling the students what the answer is, right? And rather lead them through a bunch of interesting questions to get them to arrive at an answer, right? So that's theirs. Um, special privilege it's an art class and it's one where i typically don't have to grade you know so i i acknowledge that that i have that extra latitude to be but but that is the way i like to operate when i'm working with young people um and that's a form of coaching right and that that that, that i mean having experienced your brand of coaching that is explicitly what you do at you know shieldstenzinger.com um, yeah, thanks. It's, it's, well, I, it's, there you go. And so the, 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 the theme continues, uh, well, b being an advocate. All right. So that's another, another thing we do. And yeah, I literally just got hired to do that. <laughs> right. Like my job with there CXC is like, as the executive director is to be an advocate for cartoonists and for mm -hmm. the public. Right. Um, an advocate is somebody who, who creates meaningful connections between the public and whatever field you're advocating for, making the public have a deeper and more nuanced and more, um, mm, profound connection with the thing that you are representing. So, um, I just I just got interviewed uh, for an event that I'll be doing later on this year, and the the person interviewing me said like, "What's one thing you wish more people understood about comics?" I'm like, "Okay, yeah, this is this is what we do. This is advocacy, right? Is answering that question." So, so and and we have to advocate for ourselves as you know independent business people, right? Yeah, that's true. Like like that's a let's see the. Where let's see the problems. I guess we're we're describing in a way all of these are are sort of um, skills and general pro and problems to solve with that skill. So so advocates ad advocacy is you know you can use a lot of other skills to to accomplish that, um, but yet it's um, it's just it's like someone someone would hire you to do that, or you need to also do that to to get to that outcome. Someone would hire you for, um, mm -hmm. yeah being able to present the benefits of the thing to it's the your audience you're trying to reach send that mm -hmm. signal this is i mean advocacy is probably one of the key um i guess if we had to prioritize these different things we do it, when, with the topic we're talking about today i mean advocacy it's like this is advocating for yourself this is our overall yeah, yeah so like understanding what you do and how to describe that to your to your audience is a big deal mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah and i i then I, I put prototyping on the list as well uh, because a lot of times going through some kind of um creative progression to uh, explore a small or large idea you need to create something in order to to be an instrument through which to learn and so some researchers are uh, very focused on well you can learn just by talking and you can also learn by talking, but also I'm a, I am a fan on, uh, of the idea of introducing a th an object, a, 
um, whether it could be it could be your writing. It can be close to talking, um, but then it could also be um, a landing page. It could be uh, a screen. It could for you know one tiny portion of a of an app. It could be a physical object. It could be something on paper, but like to get the idea out of you. So you're not just in the land of conceptual exploration. You're, you're taking a step toward concrete and prototyping is a, is, is a big part of that. Yep. For me. And, and prototyping is a way to describe how problems are um, problems. Solutions to challenges can take on many forms and the challenge can sometimes be an ongoing and fluid thing that you're responding to in a lot of different ways. Right. And that as designers, artists, visual storytellers, it's, it's not as simple. Often it's not as simple as throw money at it and then let an expert go, I'm done. Right. Um, There's, there's various ways of testing whether or not this solution is the right solution too, and making that 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 um, process more apparent to everybody involved. Which there you go. Then that's that's facilitation, right? So, yep. yeah, yep. They all connect. So yeah, I mean, honestly, that so we could introduce. Oh, I could introduce myself in like <laughs> an even more awkward way, <laughs> because that's there's there's just a lot going on that that are all like all these pieces are relevant um and that's one of the things for me personally when i'm uh just on the ground dealing with uh conveying my own personal creative identity it's um that's this matchmaking puzzle where i'm trying to say like well in this conversation i need to emphasize this thing Mm -hmm. more than this other thing Mm -hmm. yeah so how do we get more specific so can we drill down and get a little bit more specific as to like who who we're doing this for? These are things that we do. I think part of that identity, well, let's let's just acknowledge that this is a bias that we both have is we're always thinking about it in terms of who, to whose benefit, what's in it for the people that we're trying to serve and who are those people? Service driven uh design and, you know, art. So, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, that's, I like that. I like that framing a lot because it, it, it's like you can be uh, service driven and a little too quiet and not clear enough to um, someone more further outside your circle that can use your services. And that's one thing that I've been really trying to hone in the, in the recent years, which is being able to, you know, reach Um, reach a wider audience that I know I can help because I've encountered and tested ideas in enough situations where I'm like, I know that um, product managers, technology leaders and whatnot, I know because I've seen it work when I've worked together with, with folks of different backgrounds where I'm like, there's a way to package what I do. I know I can have more of an impact with that group. And it's, it's like, it's not just thinking it through so I can get it done. And so making a useful thing, it's like, going further with that, where that thing plus the communication surrounding it is the mechanism. It's not just, hey, it feels good to make workshops. It feels great to make a game or whatever. It's like, you got to go further. I know I need to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, let's see. So so thinking of like, I guess that's describing the problem, but you're thinking of like a specific example. Can you... Um, well, yeah. So, like, just name, that. yeah, just name specifically what people or what groups you do all those different tasks for as a way ah, to model yeah. this this activity of defining one's identity. Like, it's one thing to say I do all these things, and then here we go. I'm putting it out on a you know a stand to say like hire me. Um, right. But then you have to like be able to say what customer you're trying to customer, customer the person who you're going to engage with trade with. Um, yeah. Who is that supposed to be? How, how do how do you know to say who who to say yes to, who to say no to? And how do you how do you create a definition so that the people who are the right people to say yes to you will say yes to you? Uh, an example I think of recently is uh, someone was trying to convince me to teach at the college level, and I'm really not that interested at teaching college classes. I have nothing against college classes. I went to college, but it's just it's not. 
is not where I feel like my my skills would be best utilized. My skills are best utilized for middle grade and high school. Um, I really enjoy working with that age group, and I think I'm really optimized for working with those age groups. And so that when I started working, you know, teaching at the Columbus College of Art Design for um, young people, I felt like, okay, I'm this is my niche. This is where I feel like I'm, you know, of of maximum utility, and. I had to explain that to somebody, you know, it's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm really happy doing this. And I feel like I'm really good at this, you know? And they're like, oh, okay, well, I didn't understand. I just heard you were a teaching artist. So I assumed that you wanted to teach comics at a college, not that interested, you know? So how do you make, make that definition more clear by defining what groups and what specific pe people performing specific tasks do you want to help? So let's see, as far as, um, I, I think, I really deal well with bringing uh, creative process and thinking and uh, design skills and disciplines to um, adult professionals. But then there's kind of a, this gradation where um, I, I, fi I find a lot of the materials that I, that I enjoy making and I, I enjoy helping people in other age ranges as well, like middle school on up is probably, so it's kind of a, kind of a ramp for me where it's like, I think I'm strongest more toward uh, high school and working adults, but then I, I do, I'm fairly effective at the, the middle school level, level as well. And there's this common theme about uh, encouragement and uh, playful explore, exploration in a, in a disciplined, thoughtful enough way to help with, um, with discovery, skill connection, skill expansion. And then it's typically cross-discipline with, you know, combining storytelling plus games or um, design plus um, art and that kind of thing. I, I, because I'm, I'm encouraging this overall act of um, con uh, connecting wherever you're at, your skills, saying that if, you're, if, you, if you hunt for those connections, uh, you're going to you're going to be more effective, in, well, effective, effective in what you're doing, and um, and and relatable with uh, to to others. So let's let's find those those fun connections. So um, that's that's like a, a theme that I that I find uh, works well with my different audiences of a variety of age ranges. Mm -hmm. As far as specific problems, it's like you know, like indie creators, makers of. Um, uh, uh, makers and artists that's that's a that's certainly a, a, a group of folks that i'm uh that i that i work to reach people who are building more confidence in their skills and all that um and doing that combining thing of like storytelling plus something mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah that's that's something you've talked about in the past that i've always hung on to is when you did research for ui and ux projects is that you were like i'm I'm more interested in what people are doing, what activity, what verb are they, you know, engaged with versus like, what's their age? What's their economic background? What, what cohort do they exist in? That's data too, but I want to know what people are doing. And so I thought that that was like a really great way of like a, a great kind of specificity to key in on. It's like when I think about what students am I, uh, am I specifically trying to serve as a part of this of defining my teaching identity, right? It's like, uh, kids who identify as artists, right? Uh, kids who participate in after school programs because that's primarily where I work. Uh, I tend to work best with kids who are the kind of kids who draw even when they're not supposed to draw, right? The kids who show up because their parents want some kind of educational babysitting, like I'll reach those kids and I'm really proud of the fact that I reach those kids and I get them kind of excited about being there. Um, but you know, like where I feel like my teaching is most effective is with the kid who's like shows up ready to meet me halfway, right? Um, so it's like, what, what are the common things these kids are doing? Well, they're drawing when they're not supposed to um, and they are interested enough and they have a supportive environment enough that they can show up to these after school things. Um, hmm. I really appreciate you remembering that verb thing because uh, because that does and that, that really is where I... I, I meet people where they're uh, when they're trying to act in the creative process, and that verb, that situation, it's a it's a it's a thing that we can we can all connect with. We don't have to, and that exactly is how I relate to groups and organizations because mm. uh, 
that common purpose for a team, uh, whether you know large or small or what have you, things get so stuck when everyone's like, I'm this hat and this is how I see the world and I only see the world in this way there because this is what I'm rewarded to do. And mm -hmm. I know that you're a whole human. I know that you've got more in your background and beliefs and ideas and skills than what you're, what you're doing right now. So in a way, it's like you can get a meeting of people together from engineering and, um, and so, you know, different creative labeled backgrounds or whatever. And I say creative labeled backgrounds because I'm like, throw that out. Like creativity is a human, is, is humanity. And this is our, uh, our, we're, we're all tool makers and shapers and users. And then, and we can, uh, we can help ourselves and one another accomplish the thing. So I, I like to do that unifying thing with, when, with the groups. And it's like, it's the verb, your role matters. I honor your role. You are awesome and have so much accomplishment and whatnot. And if you try to interact with everyone around you, emphasizing that you're, um, you're a, a leader, a manager, a, um, uh, what, uh, let's see, a higher level in a, in a discipline, you're, you may have a filtering effect both on yourself and the people around you. And I want the filters thrown out the door and then let's, let's unify on the verb and the actions and create with um, a sense of greater possibility. Right. And so that's the thing that I'm, I, I try to infuse in all those different in the, in the different you know, activities and whatnot, but, um, but I'm still working on the language for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause it doesn't sound appealing. Nobody buys that general um, thing. Uh, but they'll, they'll roll with it in a session and then they'll talk with me after and they'll, um, they're like, wow, that was so, it was so nice to not have to, you know, that whole, like, let's leave our titles at the door kind of thing and just face the problem with everything that we are and, and listen and build on one another's, um, thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty useful. And I, and I'm really good at that when it comes to groups. And so that's, a, and I think the unifying element there is that focusing on the verb. Mm -hmm. Focusing on the verb and reminding people that you are not your title, right? Like, it, or yeah. rather, your title is not all that you are, right? Yeah. You bring that, right? But you bring more. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So like, so like drilling down specifically on things that people do, I think is something that you have been doing for a long time. Um, and so I wonder if you could like, just like, we only got a few minutes, so we should head, head for a break. So I'm wondering if you just like hit a few different constituencies that, that you could easily identify by focusing on what, <clears throat> uh, what verb they're using, what, what, what endeavor are they engaged in? Hmm. So for individuals, it's, it's, it's a learning process. And then, uh, adding this sort of uh, user-centered learning feedback loop to your, your individual business. But then for groups, it's um, the learning process is a bigger, de it's a, it has more complexity. So you're trying to find things to unify on like a, like a, like a learning system, like a rhythm of research. And so you're building a research infused team and it's not that you, the data decides for you. Everyone has to participate with the research and the learning and the data. And to, to develop that is a, um, it's typically an extra thing. And so it has to be looked found, you know, you have to be able to find the value from everyone's perspective and, and, uh, and I can help with facilitating that process. And so it's not just a one-time event, it's leaving behind this ongoing practice of, of a, of a, of a changed way to work and mm -hmm. to make meaningful products. So that can happen with their, when you're just, even if, if you're, you're jumping into like user-centered things like um, like, like you've your organization has bought into the, the like, what further with UX because a lot of times in the beginning that's a role that one person has but then later on everyone's more deeply involved right and I can help at, um, at different places in the timeline to help with the so, leveling up. 
so like what what I'm hearing here is that what we were both doing is like sort of like coming up with a list of all the different skills that we employ in order to do the various jobs that we do. Right. Um, and then try to identify what groups we're trying to serve specifically based on what they do. And then comes okay, identity is synthesis, right? So how do we synthesize these all of these disparate things? Because something that gets we've been talking about this for years is the quote unquote many hats that one has to wear. And one would, there's a suggestion there that there's a time for this one and a time for that one. And there's a truth to that. <clears throat> but I also think that there's uh, that metaphor reduces the idea to an extent in that it, uh, it hides the interconnectivity between all those different roles. Right. And, I think part of the trick of this is finding some kind of way, like method of synthesizing all these various things into a, a, a cohesive idea that is easy to describe. Like when I say cartoonist and teaching artist, okay, this guy, he, he, he draws a certain kind of art and odds are when he says teaching artist, he teaches that kind of art, right? There isn't a whole lot of leaping there. Now I haven't fit in the advocacy angle very clearly yet because like there's also this whole idea of like I work with nonprofit organizations to create larger events, right? I could say cartoonist, teaching artist, event organizer, right? Um, that part has been missing for some time. And yeah, Rob, you're looking very pleased that I, <laughs> that I finally tripped upon that last that last pebble. But um, but yeah, yeah. So um, but yeah, how do you how do you synthesize all those ideas? And I think we could talk about that in the second half of the show. What do you say? I think that's great. I and I. I feel like our own exploration of this, hopefully this, this is providing some, some tangible examples where, um, cause you can hear our progression, our descriptions and whatnot. And what you do is probably different than what we do, but uh, like, uh, I mean, hopefully this is, this is a chance where, you know, if you're in a situation where you can do some notes or scribbling or whatnot, it's, um, like, and you probably have that same descriptive process, um, challenge to face as well. Like, um, uh, how did you say that it was so nice it was the um like the synthesis identity is synthesis you know and then the, the yeah. progression of the yeah the, the the skills and the groups yeah so we're gonna um we're gonna keep working this process so i'm, I'm reminded of i'm reminded of an exercise that uh ui ux designer sally carson led led us through when back mm -hmm. when she was in ann arbor and i lived in ann arbor and she was going through this whole idea of like brainstorming different topics on sticky notes and just sticking them to a wall and then like putting them out on a table and said like, she like, you know, invited us to look at all these different ideas in the table and said, where are the patterns? Look for the patterns. What do you see? What, what connections do you see between these disparate ideas? Um, which I'm sure you've done similar kinds of, um, you know, workshopping with the, the, the group coaching that you've done in the past, right? And facilitation. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um it's a great technique where essentially the if you're doing some kind of ge uh, generative process, you're you, the, the the idea that you're facilitating yourself to allow expansion and exploring, and they call it flaring, right? Where you mm. flare wide, and then when you theme or you connect or you group, you 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 start to focus, right? So you go mm -hmm. wide and then narrow, and then you may do that a couple of times to help um, really create some strong connections with with where you're where you're wanting to go. So, yeah, that would be a a, a useful thing for. So I would actually say, like, this would be a good point to if you're watching this after the fact or listening to this after the fact, pause the audio or video, break out some sticky notes. Rob and I are big fans of sticky notes, and. Uh, write out like as big a list as you can think of, of all the different tasks or skills you employ to do the work that you do, that you find most interesting, that you would like to get more, more work doing. And then write out and maybe even on a different colored sticky note, a whole bunch of the different constituencies you'd like to serve specifically based on what they do, not just on the age group or the, the, the demographic or the geography, but like what things are they doing that identifies them as somebody you'd like to serve put them all on a table, see if you can look for the patterns and then come back and listen to the second half of the show where we talk about how we think about synthesis, right? All right. Does that sound good, Rob? Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> okay. We're turning this one to a mini workshop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we are going to come back and talk about synthesizing these ideas into some kind of semblance of an identity, which is not 
the all of you. It is just a part of you. It is a a sample of you. It's the little cup in the grocery store, the, the little tiny piece of the, of the business that you could taste to get you to buy the whole thing. Um, but before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash lean into art or Rob recently set up the URL, leanintoart.com slash Patreon. It'll get you there. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you say, I believe in Rob and Jersey and what they do, and I'd like this thing to be more sustainable, you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. You can also cancel at any time. So you could just like come in, you know, make a donation, avail yourself of all the behind the scenes stuff, and then check out if you want. Uh, but we want to thank five people who have been supporting us on an ongoing basis. And first up, Dado, or is it Dado? It's D-A-D-O. And you can find them on Twitter at Datotronic, Datotronic. Thank you, Dado or Dado. We really appreciate your support. And Gail Bushman. You can find Gail on Instagram at Nightingale Art. Thank you, Gail. And Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. Still one of the most interesting names of people who support us on Patreon. Thank you, Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. It means a lot to us. And Catherine Sugru. And you can find Catherine on Twitter at Kat Sugru. That's with a K and it's double O's on the Sue and the Gru. And Ashley Knapp, thank you, Ashley. Longtime supporter of the show. You can find Ashley on Twitter at Control Alt Lee, and you can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you'll find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want with fellow leaners in a safe space. And it also gets you access to some uh, Patreon Patreon only sections of our Discord, patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you, everybody. It make, it means a lot to us. It super does. Thank you so much. All right. Well, with that, it's time to Whoa. synthesize. <laughs> Push the ideas together. Smush. <laughs> Get it all together. Punch castle. Synthesize. <laughs> Punch a castle and synthesize. <laughs> so, yeah. How do we do that? How do we? Where, where do you want to start with this idea of like how do we take all these things and like put them together in some kind of meaningful? collective idea so let's see in a way this is a lot like a um like an information architecture exercise and what you described as with that whole sort of um brainstorming and then theming the flaring and or the exploration and then focusing um it's a good way to uh to it's a good way to, to, to start. And you may find a pattern in here that has a uh, strong resonance, but, or maybe you don't. And then, so if you don't like, where is the language, where is your audience? Like, where are their, like, how do they describe what you're doing and, um, and go explore that. Like when they use a word, is it the same thing that you mean? Can you say it in a way that, that may, makes more sense to them, which could be through explore the landscape and see how other people who do what you do describe what you do to their audience. And uh oh, Rob, I found out there's other cartoonists who are teaching artists who work with kids. I mm-hmm. guess that territory has been claimed and I'm out. <laughs> Career over. Career over. All done. Somebody no. somebody else thought of it first. So <laughs> it's funny. Originality, uh, what would that originality myth demon demons and myths? Mm-hmm somewhere lurking. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause I mean, I guess it, fe- there's a mixed bag. So like you could feel incredible. You could, there's a set, there's another demon that, so let's say you are that original and you got the thing that nobody knows about. Here's what sucks. Nobody knows about it yeah. and they don't know how to describe it. They don't know how to relate to it. So that's one of the worst aspects of the originality demon because they're, they're a terrible uh, preventer of getting your word out. Mm-hmm. So, cause, cause one way to look at this is, is like, what, what's a way to learn as far as connecting with a mar- an audience and connecting with people? Well, ob- observable, observable phenomena, right? So you can look at the observable phenomena of the people that you interact with when you describe what you do and with the things you put into the world and how they are interacting with that. And you can mm-hmm. look at, again, the other like secondary research of, so that, you know, the primary things would be the things you create and put into the world and then you can observe. But then the secondary research would be what are other people doing and saying, and what can you glean from that? What patterns are you seeing? Mm-hmm. And 
that's um i i like the the language you put in the show notes here mining our constituency's language in order yeah. to speak it yeah how do they describe the world i i just did and this is on youtube i will link to it in the show notes um this is a uh a webinar that I recently performed for the Ohio Arts Council. And uh, it was a video called, it's an hour long video, it's called Documenting Your Classroom Experience. And I did it for fellow teaching artists as uh, it's, it's a, it's an exercise that explores what is the structure of a lesson plan that people in educational institutions would recognize. What are the sort of like the fundamental chunks of information they look for in order to evaluate whether or not this is something they want to have happen in their organization. And then the, the, the mid part of the webinar is saying, like, even if you've never done this before, if you've taught before, you're doing all these things. Let's just like identify what activities are happening in the room so that you can map them onto this structure. So therefore, you can create lesson plans that would build more trust between you and hosting organizations. It's learning the language they use internally. And I'm not I'm not talking about uh jargon although some jargon can get in there sometimes some jargon yeah. gets in there because yeah. it's like it's it's formal and informal there's things that emerge yeah. when all of a sudden people start using the same hashtag for a thing which i don't know hashtags are a mixed bag whatever but like uh but it, like the clean use and not misuse of the idea of a hashtag or whatnot it's it's this language that emerges and people arrive on because they want to share and connect with connect with ideas but then formalized um, groups and institutions that are there for uh, preserving and improving and growing in a discipline then they develop language that that's true that's true I mean we, we say okay. at the end of every, every episode ends with leaners aren't wieners right and like what does that even mean if you've never encountered the show before right but people who have been around for 300 or something episodes know exactly what that means right yeah. so I, I, I agree yes so yeah it, it like like so look to the groups that you want to serve. This goes back to this whole idea about networking is like going to a cocktail party and handing out your business card versus going to a cocktail party and listening to the conversations and waiting for the moment when you hear something where you can actually be of service, right? So it's like, I spend a lot of time talking with teachers. And after my workshops, I talk with the teachers, you know, to like find out, okay, like, well, what's one thing could could be done better or I call them ahead of time like this is something that's in the webinar it's like I call them ahead of time and say like what are what are like three things you hope the kids will better understand as a result of my visit like what are what's something that's happening in your classroom right now that you that you wish another party could come in from the outside world and reinforce right um and listening hard for the, how, the way they say it. Like there was this one moment I remember very early on when I started doing school visits where a teacher said to me, oh, comics are a wonderful genre. And I was like, what genre? What are you talking about? Comics aren't a genre. Comics are a medium. How, what, do you, what do you even say? And like after like this moment of whirling, like trying to figure out like, why did they use that word? I just asked, like, why are you using that word? I, I, you know, like I'm doing an Inigo Montoya. I do not think it means what you seem to think it means. And uh they were like, well, you know, like the genre of poetry. And, the, and they were using genre in this way I've never heard it used before. But internally in their world, that was the way they used it. And I'm like, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Like when, when I think of the word genre, I think of like Western, science fiction, you know, horror. You know, but you're talking about genre as a form of literature. Okay, well, now I understand. And I, when you say things, you know, uh, I don't necessarily use that word. But my point is, is that like, listen, ask questions and so on. So I think I That's belabored so that important. point. <clears throat> no, it's not. It's not belaboring mm. at all. It's like the right. I don't. What's what's the what's a. It's the what's the what would be a word to say? It's welcome laboring. It's you know. <laughs> it's hang out with uh, your friend laboring <laughs> time because that those that is so powerful because asking why getting clarification and uh getting a deeper understanding because you this is that's the job is getting out of your own head that's the mm -hmm. job is like you yeah. can have your assumptions and your originality and be not relatable probably with your audience but then you will find bridges and ways to connect the things that you're offering and your why and your reasoning and all that and uh, I think when we chatted recently about this with the, the identity, identity work I've been working on, and uh, like I, I love that exercise by Simon Sinek, the start with why, 
Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. where he sort of, what is he called? The golden circle or something where it's like in the middle is like the why of, of uh, it forms kind of a bullseye diagram. The why of your business, your endeavor, your team or what have you. And then there's the, um, the how as the next ring and the what uh, as the outer, right? And a lot of times we describe the what or the how, and then we're like, that's the product, that's the everything. And his belief is that, well, if you, if you start with the why, you're going to have the resonant core of belief and that will make the difference with connecting and being relatable with your audience. And I think, yes, also um, connect and relate with your audience because how you describe your why may not be how they describe the why. And that's and where, yeah, we, we can't test our own language until we engage it with the constituency that we're trying to serve, right? I, I had a conversation with another teaching artist recently, uh, given the whole situation that we're facing right now, where a lot of people are homebound and, you know, facing all sorts of different challenges with being homebound. In this specific instance, it was like having children at home. And they said, like, yeah, there's a lot of kids that probably need distracting right now, and we could be of service to them to help them provide some needed distractions for the kids. I'm like, well, how about we say, you know, enrichment for their children? <laughs> because, you know, it's like you use the word distraction, and it makes me think, like, we're making balloon animals and just, like, diverting the children for a little while to give the parents a little bit of breather. But what we bring is a little bit more, you know, meaningful than a diversion, right? Um, we can we can we can position it and we can talk about it in a way that reinforces stuff that the parents are already trying to have this, the, their children achieve, you know. And that and then yes, we're taking the heat off the parents a little bit by doing like you know live streams and home visits th through you know uh, Skype or Zoom meetings or whatever. But you know, let's a, let's think here, think about our language. It's yeah, but and what a perfect tension there. Because in a way, yeah. you're you're learning. This is this is research through your conversation. You're collaboratively exploring and whatnot, and you're discovering, in a way, a uh, an idea that's not fully harmonious with where you would prefer to position your 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 work. Right. 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 Yet, it's where the audience is, in a way. Right. 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 And so now you have the puzzle of like, well, how do you include the like? Well, why are they saying that? And their language, the the their needs. And then re redescribe what you do, where mm -hmm. your your why matches their their why in a, in a like a really um, approachable ident um, identifiable way. Part of our, our I would say part of yours and my identities is that we like our, we try to be careful in thinking about what's in it for the people that we're trying to help. Right. And, and speak sure. to that. Speak to that in a very as clear a way as we possibly can. You know, um, and and. I, I, I want to be careful to say like okay, that's that's our approach to this thing and it's not a prescription but we but we like we like it a lot because um, I have encountered a number of people who just don't think that way they're like well what my my value or the thing that I make it's self evident that is good and I don't wh why would I have to be so pr uh, um, didactic to the the consumer to explain to them why this is good for them when it's just good you know it's like well that's an approach um, I'm not convinced of that, that that that's the most robust approach <laughs> and i err on the side of being a little bit over uh explicit to the audience that i'm trying to help you know but um you know it's like so, some people want to dial back to simplicity or like say like well look at look at apple apple just says good better best and they don't have to say anything more than that they've got a video where just like some cool music plays and you look at the thing spin slowly in slow motion we just know it's good you know okay well but that was not produced in a way that was um i i let's see i think whatever your process to make stuff rock on if you have a thing that doesn't that purposefully chooses to exclude you can do that i if you work with me i will prescribe including like that's it i'm going to prescribe the heck out of that so i would include <laughs> you even if you didn't want to be included if you involve me right yeah so that's what happens uh so it's just a it's a different way of it's a different outlook and look at it. it's it's fine it's it's sort of the whole tension between you know what is art and all that it, the mm -hmm. the arguments of of um you know fine arts versus industrial arts and applied whatever and eh, you know like, like if you if you have 
there's a system ask like so how are how is how is your mechanism being supported somewhere somehow there's a there's a, a value trade going on and do you need to think about that or not in the more toward being either integrating different disciplines because you you're at the 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 epicenter of collaboration or if you are needing to wear a lot of hats then yeah there you go if you're part of a mechanism where you have a you know you have a patron or you have a an organization where i mean that's this is where you you choose a career path that fits well with with how you see the world hopefully mm -hmm. you got some good good exchange going on there that works for you sustainably but anyway different maps yeah the world there um so uh let's see oh, gosh there were so many ideas in that um what, what are you thinking so well so i mean like we're talking about like having a sense of like clarifying um right like when i was having that conversation with that teaching artist like okay let's take the the the, the genesis of what you're noticing where a need is to be met and let's clarify that message to make it so that it's maximum uh benefit to both parties what do you do when you notice that the message could be better or clearer, right? Like what if what if you don't have another person to bounce the idea off of, like in that specific example I was talking about, right? Well, at some point you're meeting the your your idea meets the world. And then mm -hmm. hopefully you're tuning in to this and trying to get some get some insight of, well, you have the performance of sales of, uh, of, you know, how's your product doing? Or you have other performance as far as if you're putting ads in the world, uh, what kind of impressions are you getting and what kind of engagement are you getting? So if it's a video ad, are people watching it? And is, if there's a, an action, like what are people doing? And then is there a conversion after the action? So like there's all these stages that you can think of with um, just exposure of your business to the world. You can think of that as a specific ad campaign, or you can think of it as um, maybe you do podcasts and you put, you know, you put, do put ads in them uh, to mention the products you make or um, <laughs> social media posts, all that. Mm. Somehow you're getting the stuff in the world and then, and you can think of, uh, this is this, and this is the challenge with, with, um, with quantitative versus qualitative data with the quantitative data. You get you you have some numbers. There is some signal to know what is going on, but you're not necessarily going to know why. Like you said this thing in a tweet, and lots of people came to, to the, you know, followed up on that link, and you got maybe some okay percent of sales from that. Well, why? Um, you can have some guesses, and 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 you know, hopefully you do have some guesses because that that's going to be the ongoing feedback loop of, of evolving your business and what you put into the world. But then talking is also going to help. So putting the thing in front of people and seeing how it performs. Um, and so for instance, like I've been doing this, this coaching business now um, more and more as, as a, uh, as, as one of my main business endeavors for like oh, eight months plus somewhere in there. And um, I have some learnings as far as, you know, putting out some ads and the product placement, conversations with customers, this kind of thing. And um, I noticed that I kind of had, um, in my opinion, sort of a classic um, website mistake where, um, you know, we're working on evolving. We need to evolve our brand. We're no, one of those things where you just like part of parts of it are working parts of it need to improve. And so like in a way me and Kate combining our brands and not making a big project of it and not getting like, for instance, uh, I don't know. I'm just going to pick something out that a brand that I relate to like so mule design, right? You have, you have, it, it happens to be like, there are, there are, part, there's, there's our life partners who are business partners also in mule design. And, but they have a, pretty dang strong brand together right so that's awesome it's working for them for for me and kate our brand is like a work in progress we don't have that that clear story but then when we talk about our story we're stronger right so i thought we did we pulled the classic move that a lot of a lot of companies do when they put a thing on the web they make it about them so here's so we have our why and we have some tested ideas 
but it wasn't as converting as strong as it could be. So time to iterate, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so like if you, if you look at your website and it basically tells you how, like back to you, this is the structure of your business instead of the conversation with your audience, you have work to do, right? Um, mm. And especially if, if, the, if the sort of the numbers and the kind of actual discussions you have with people are, are sort of reinforcing that this could be clearer. Um, and, uh, you know, this, gosh, who, who there was a, someone had a cheeky term for this a long time ago. It's like when corporations put on a website and they, they, they make it, it's like they're just hanging their laundry out. They, um, gosh, what was it? Is it Tamara Adlin or something like that? But it was like corporate underpants was her term for it. <laughs> Wherever, it, it just, you know, <laughs> yelling to the world how you're organized. It's like, well, how do people see you anyway? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so yeah, like actually, I've, I've I've got um, Mule Designs website up right now, mm-hmm. and it starts with this giant photograph of a bunch of like thorns, uh, like uh, like a thorny bush, and then it says here for your thorniest problems, and it says doing the right thing well isn't easy. It often takes some convincing to stop people doing the wrong thing that they find comfortable first. That's where we come in. We help organizations get the information they need. Leaders make better decisions, and design teams tell compelling stories. We'll get you out of the weeds in a jiff. And there's a button that says, tell us what you need or start with a workshop question mark. Right. Mm. That's very clear. Very. It's, it's fantastic how they're, you know, the, the, the image, so you think about what's a brand, a brand, a brand is a recognizable story and they've got that and they have the, um, and so what's a product? So a product would, would be something you'd present in that recognizable story that can, that, that represents a need that people can act on. And, and they've got all that right there on the landing page that you described. Mm-hmm. So good. Um, whereas uh, for us, we created a job for people where it was like, well, pick this coach or that coach. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we need to get past that part of the conversation into more of the reasons, you know, um, like why you're here and how we can help. Right. Mm-hmm. So, there you go. We both have been doing some iteration. So if you go to mycoachkate.com or if you go to robcoach.me, you will go to new websites that represent. What? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Let's look at that right now. Okay. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. So you picked mine. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't always have the streaming coming to, to save the bandwidth and all that stuff. So, okay. Um, yeah. So, all right. Uh, in order to tell my story, I decided to create, um, clarity through, you know, emphasis and, Mm. uh, provide this, uh, let's see, provide my products and services in a way that, you know, the conversation is led. Like you say, I'm a a cartoonist and teaching artist. Mm. So for me, it's about the user experience design and interactive storytelling. And, the, and I teach workshops. So I've got three things. I'm working on making it simpler, but like these three things are strong reasons to connect with me and you can act on that. Um, there you go. Is it, uh, it's a step in the direction. So this is, a, this is an ongoing process. Differentiating doesn't have to be a one-time event. Um, synthesizing what you're learning doesn't just happen once with a business. It's, 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 it's recurring. So Mm -hmm. I realized the the problem I had was um, a a few things as far as, mm, let's see, the, the, the collective business brand that is a big project for both Kate and I that we can, we'll revisit that. We'll, we'll fix that over time. But for now, like, how do we start with our strengths and then, you know, build from there? Let's look uh, at mycoachkate.com. Okay. Ah, very different look. Very different look, different messages. She's also offering coaching products and whatnot too. And that was another thing too, is that looking at the specific products, um, online workshops performing well, 
um, games performing well, the, co- the coaching doing okay, because I think it could, and I know it could do better. And it was a matter of um, turning it into more of a product. So coaching isn't just, well, uh, you know, f- fill a spot on your calendar with this general, this aspirational thing of coaching, right? It's, you know, like, gosh, it would be nice to have a coach, but well, I'm a little, you know, I'm a busy person doing my independent uh, business. And that sounds like a nice to have, whereas specific problems being solved with coaching. If you go to like my product page or, or Kate's, uh, I don't have her website memorized. We both have been working on these independently now. Oh, um, you're talking about mycoachkate.com? So like, so if you go to like my uh, products page. Oh, okay. Uh, so you'll see how I'm leading with. Um, so for Kate, she had her workshops page as products. Okay. So here's your products and services page. Yeah. I've got it up and on so screen. getting more specific, right? Getting more mm-hmm. specific with the coaching. And here's the thing where you had that metaphor of, of like the, like meeting at a, uh, meeting at a party and not just leading with your cards, but just listening and con- con- you know, having a conversation. Mm-hmm. Here's, that's the best, right? So meeting people and you know what you can do and you can say it in a way that's really specific for them. Because if you just have a tagline, because I would bet cartoonists and teaching artists is maybe something you might start a conversation with, but I bet that's not what you would l- in the middle of conversation with or toward the end. That's exactly right. Because uh, when I meet mixed company who are not in my field, uh, which I do a lot as an advocate, um, I get asked the question, well, what's the difference between a cartoonist and a graphic novelist? What's the difference between a cartoonist and a comics author? What's the di-? right? And I'm like, okay, yeah, these all mean the same things, but everybody's coming at it from a completely different vector. You know, like, like to, there's a large part of the world now who thinks that graphic novels, that's, that's what comics are and they don't take any other form. Right. And so then the, you know, when they find out I'm a cartoonist, well, does that mean that you do political cartoons? Does that mean you work in animation? You know? Uh, yeah. So, so depending on where the conversation is, I would bet you'd have different language. Yep. And I look at it. So your website is starting a conversation part way through and mm-hmm the more clear your website is communicating um, and this is the hard part is that you're guessing where this individual is at in the conversation. So you're trying to do the best you can as far as describing their why and your why, right. In a clear way that they can act on. And, and you're guessing you're taking a guess and like you, you can just see how that performs but you're, you're jumping further into the conversation and how you did that is going to, you know, play out as it plays out. And, and it's, it's, um, and that's where you can think of your website as an instrument to learn more from and like, what, what are people landing on or not? And, um, and, and make changes, you know, act on the data you're getting from it to, to make it better. Um, and a lot of it will be too, is, is your conversations with people over time. And then you'll look back at your website and think, um, oh gosh, that language just isn't quite, you know, how we're talking about it lately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like some language that I, I probably still have some remnants of on my website um, was something along the lines of like, as comics enjoy more, uh, more you know, uh, space in the classroom, you know, it's like, like. 10 years ago that was a that was a big part of that discussion you know they're they're finally in classrooms well now we've got people like Col- colby sharp and john shu out there who are advocating in front of them to the point where it's like well yeah yeah everybody reads comics now <laughs> so yeah yeah the conversation uh evolves and mm-hmm. um, and that's the weakness that your website um will like it'll always have because it's frozen it's stuck and it's a guess and mm-hmm. That's, um, um, but if you at least, I think it's doing, it has a chance to do a better job if you put yourself into the position of, well, it's progressing in a conversation, meeting the audience where they're at, how do they describe things? And so that's, for instance, the example of the different um, coaching products. So instead of just talking about coaching as in general, and you're just getting my time, 
you're, we're solving specific problems. Mm -hmm. That's a shift. And that that's, that's, and it is, you know, to act on this, this learning of, well, let's, let's get into the language of the audience. Let's talk about what I've learned in the, in, you know, doing this work. And it's like, well, people want to solve specific problems. People reach out to me about thinking about their career path. That's a common thing. People um, want to start using UX more. That's a common thing. People want to develop products and get their ideas out of their head. That's a common thing. So boom, those are my coaching products. Yeah. And for my personal website, uh, I basically have like three tasks that I need to perform that like three things the world has asked of me and I've made trade on, which is either drawing comics for people, selling the books that I have created or leading workshops. So when you go to jdros.com, um, that's the three buttons after my little thing. It's like, okay, here's the latest book that you're going to be able to find in stores with my name on it. And here's like a paragraph about me. And then, boom, hire Jersey to make comics, purchase Jersey's comics, or hire Jersey to lead a comics workshop. Those are the only three navigational links on the page, right? This is really strong. Well, you helped with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but but in some of the early iterations of the web page, like you were like, well, yeah, I can, can you whittle it down to like three, like as few actions as people need to take, right? And it's like, okay, let's put the verb on there. Hire me to do this. Hire me to do that. Hire me to do that. What are you looking for? What are you looking for from me? These are the three things that people tend to ask of me, right? And yeah, you have such excellent focus. So you have you have more product focus um, yeah. than than I have. And, um, and that, and what I was trying to, and so that, and that's an interesting puzzle. It's, it's like, yeah, this is even, yeah, this is really great. Um, with, with have, having such a strong, um, strong focus, um, and then sign up for a newsletter. That's really cool. So people can act on, so they can learn quickly, act quickly and yep. in their language. Yeah. Although the language needs to be updated. Like I said, like if you go to like the hire me to do a workshop, it, it, it really is like it's language that I've been slowly editing for the past decade, but it probably just needs a complete overhaul. It just needs to be and it probably needs some better images because um, I have a lot more photos of me in workshops now. Right. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So uh, I think I think we've talked about this. I think we've covered this topic well, like as much as we're going to cover it today. Um, and this is the kind of thing where, guess what? We have a Discord we're going to talk about in a second. You can follow up with us and comment and ask for more clarification or more approaches, more points of view you can provide to the discussion. We could take it and we can revisit this topic again because this is the cool thing about a project like this is that these topics, uh, the, the, the conversation and the landscape is going to be forever changing so it's worthwhile to come back to the topic and see how we feel about it years later you know or months later for that matter uh so what do you say rob we take one more break and then we'll check in on this week's two minute practice i think it's fantastic that was that was a great exploration and we'll totally continue this topic great uh yeah, I know, I know it's something we think about like on a regular basis, so why wouldn't we? All right, so in about, in about two minutes, we're going to come back and look at what this week's two-minute practice is, which is the actionable item we put at the end of every episode where it's like, here's the thing we can try doing this week just to like keep ourselves creatively limber. But before we do that, we got to thank a few more people who make the show possible. And those people are us. We make the show possible. We make all sorts of different stuff and we bring all the thoughts that occur to us when we're making this stuff into this project called Lean Into Art. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is the 4 Million Years Later podcast. It is, yes, it's another podcast I do, and which means it's free. Uh, but it's, it's, and it's a bit different than Lean Into Art, although I think if you're a fan of the way Rob and I approach topics on the show, you'll probably enjoy the way my buddy Hoover and I dissect and analyze this 1980s cartoon called The Transformers Generation One. And so we watch an episode a week in order, in the, the show's story order, we finally decided, because there are some discrepancies as to what the actual order of the show was between like air date and script date. Um, and then we check in with each other and just like talk about what we saw. And we come at it from the standpoint of like, this is the way that this show connected with us, with us as children. And this is the way we think about it now. And 
there are some big differences in the way I think about this show from my childhood to my adulthood, but I come back loving it with the, to the same degree, even though what I love about it is very different. So you can find that at 4millionyearslater.com or in your favorite podcatcher. Uh, Rob, you want to talk about some of the products you have on Skillshare? I totally do. And I just, before I do, I, I want to say that uh, the 4 million years later podcast is a lot of fun. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's more than, uh, I think it's a, Maga I'm going to say the Transformers uh, series season one is, I guess it's the right MacGuffin for you, you and Hoover. <laughs> right. But like, but it is kind of a, an interesting MacGuffin for all the exploration, the detailed, um, scene by scene analysis and whatnot, which is just fascinating. So if you want to think about story, it's a fantastic resource for you. It's yeah, it's a, it's a lot more than you would think about um, the thoughtful choices, both visually and um, plot wise and character. I mean, all those things are so commonly explored. Yeah. I, you, you will, you will not escape confronting my philosophy of storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an excellent place for, for a lot of that. It's, it's, yeah, it's a great resource. Oh, thank you. So let's talk about your Skillshare. Okie doke. So um, I have, I have workshop, workshops on, on Skillshare that I would say the easy way to get there is to go to robstenzinger.com uh, slash store.html hmm. or you can just go to the landing page and click on the store link and you'll see that I do a variety of workshops that um, a lot of them are on Skillshare, but then uh, you can actually pick them up individually on Gumroad. And so I have easy links for you uh, in either case right there on my store page. So if mm. you go to um, like, like if you want to learn uh, user journey mapping, which is a powerful collaborative tool to bring together your team or to just help you make sure you're like getting out of your comfort zone, wear more hats, really think something through from the perspective of your users, doing what they do over time, integrating, interacting with your product or service. Fantastic technique. Um, so drawing user journey maps, uh, customizing your next creative challenge. That's a really handy one. Take that challenge into your control, make it work for you. Like you're creating a product or something to learn or just dabble but then, you know, not get overwhelmed because creative challenges, they can do that. Um, goal setting using design plus, plus storytelling is a great place to um, just develop uh, your goals, again, from a different perspective with uh, six, well, in this case, seven, if you go to the, the Skillshare thing or buy it at Gumroad, um, exercises in a, in a journal and a video series that, that it's, it's like 40 minutes ish long that walk you through a few different things to think about your goals and to be able to tell the story well. So another synthesis exercise like we mm. talked about today. And then there's a really fun one called sketching the happiest kitty in the universe. That's a workshop to just get into uh, designing happy cartoon characters and uh, enjoy that. Enjoy that with uh, as a break for yourself or um, have the whole family play along or your whole team. That'd be fun. Oh, that would be fun. And the last thing we hope you will check out today, from us anyway, is the, our Discord. Uh, yes, Leland Hart has a forum now, and there are three public channels where anybody can sign up and you know provide us with future topics for shows, comment on past shows, and get engaged with the discussion with us on the stuff that you know you've been encountering on Leland Hart. But there's also a challenges underscore quests channel where you can post some of your two minute practices that you've been working on. I know Rob and I have been sharing ours. And then there's three channels that are only for Patreon users, uh, Castle Level Up, Gentle Town, and then just a pure social channel where you just post about what's going on in your life. Uh, there is no exact website to point you at, but we will have an invite link to the Discord channel in the show notes for this episode. And you can you know, use the app or you can use it on your desktop. So with that, how about we talk about the two minute practice? Ah, perfect timing. How has your two minute practice been going, Jersey? Well, Rob, I feel pretty good about this week's uh, challenge. Um, as some may remember, uh, we 
we had a special guest, Greg Jiegel, on, and the topic of uh, the, the sort of like a theme of that one was like checking in with people. And I, but I think you suggested, or maybe Greg suggested, writing down questions to check in, right, questions you might have for people you haven't touched base with in some time, uh, people in your sort of close knit network of friends, colleagues, etc. Uh, and then I added an extra layer of challenge because I can't walk into a room and somebody says the word challenge without me saying, like, how can you also make something out of it? Uh, and so I said, well, how about you send a postcard? You write a two-minute postcard to a friend and that you haven't checked in with in a while. Um, and I did. I did, like, six or seven of them. And uh, the only way I was able to do it, and I, I just mailed off the whole bunch of them like yesterday. Um, the only way I was able to do it was by, it was like two minutes. Like you can write like, oh, this to use the little Dr. Katz joke, like the city has built big buildings I like food by. Um, but I just did like doodles on all of them, right? It's like, okay, I'm gonna write a few words. Like, hey, just thinking of you, hoping you're well, hoping you're safe and healthy. Um, and then here's a drawing of Kool-Aid man smashing through a wall, you know, <laughs> saying, instead of saying, oh yeah, saying, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so and, and I just like broke out my colored pen, you know, like I have a pen with like a whole bunch of different colored inks on it. And I just doodled it with that. Like because like the thing about like these color pens is like you're not gonna get amazing detail and it's not asking you for that, right? So like it was they were very intentionally sloppy and um loose drawings because I, I only had two minutes, right? So there was some prep involved in that, like Leading up to the challenge, I went and selected like eight postcards and just like laid them out and was like, okay, these are the ones I want to send. Um, had a sheet of stamps at the ready. So like there was like there was like a little bit of setup time initially. I would say like maybe 10 minutes of setup time. And then it was just like, okay, two minutes go, blah, 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 stamp, done, you know. But the only way, again, the only way I made that, if I was trying to write like thoughtful, meaningful prose, dear Beauregard, you know, the war has been going on for 12 years, you know, um, I couldn't have done it in two minutes. <laughs> so, ah, uh, that so I don't. I'm blown away that that uh, how well that this one worked for uh, for you. And it was like this was. It's not that I foreshadowed I was going to bomb this one, but uh, but I knew that if I if I did if I did this, it would have been the 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 questions and the and uh, generating ideas to um, you know to reach out to and, and whatnot, and and even the list of who who I want to um, to to reach out to. Just I, and I love the habit and the idea of it. So mm -hmm. I need to revisit this one. I need to redo because I did not mm. succeed with this one. Uh, I think I think when you were talking about this as the challenge, I think I smelled a sense of like that might be a little bit too heavy duty of a thinking exercise to do in such a short amount of time because the questions that I would, I would want, I know that I would be compelled to ask something super thoughtful and insightful about that specific person. Right. Uh, that that's, that's my own cr or shortcoming is like, I would want to wow them with how insightful I could be about what I'm curious about in their lives. Whereas like, you know, I just recorded something with Zach Gialongo yesterday that's going to go on his Patreon and he was asking me to ask him three questions. And I thought about this challenge, you know, and I thought like, mm. ah, this is an opportunity for me to practice asking questions that are maybe not quite as specific and thoughtful to that person, but are just questions that pr provoke interesting thought. Like I asked him, what was his favorite stress food? You know, I'm like, we're in a stressful time right now. Do you have any foods that you go to? Like, like you know, soothe the beast. Um, you know, and I said like, uh, and, but then I said like, knowing that he's a big D&D &D fan, I was like, what's one, what, uh, what's your least favorite D&D &D class and alignment? You know, um, <laughs> knowing that like, it's easy to poke at a bee's nest with some people, right? Like, oh, what, what, what ticks you off, right? Go, you know, complain for 20 minutes. Um, but uh, that's but, pretty great. Like th those are good questions. How long did it take you to come up with those? Uh, I probably did those three questions in two minutes. Um, but, but, you know, it's like I, in that instance, I was letting myself off the hook because these were questions that were about to precede a conversation with a guy that I know we can riff forever. Right. Um, if I were making these questions to put in an email, I probably would have felt more pressure 
Do you get me? So I wonder if that's the mm. framing. The framing is, I wonder if it would be helpful. I'm just pitching this at you and see what you think. What if you were writing the questions as if you were about to walk into a room and reconnect with this old friend? Like it, just before you walk in the door. Um, mm. Instead of trying to like make something to put in a letter or put in an email to them. I th I think that's that's pretty functional. I, I like the idea of, of um, having some amount of framing to mm -hmm. to help with this one because i i anytime it came up when i thought i might do this now it just felt like a mountain of resistance resistance mm -hmm. and it was the whole um you know postcards Oof, what would i use for a postcard i don't have any whatever and then the uh the questions okay let you know yay i have a safety net of just text this this is doable, and then it's just this. Nah, why? What? How am I going to do this? And I was thinking as you were describing this too, it's like like, so having a framing of of what would you say to just reconnect as a as a quick greeting, greeting style question, right? That's mm -hmm. great. I also thought too, like you could do the thing where you you look at your social feed and what has this person been you know doing or making, talking about whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then you could do the thing like we described in the full episode of the the facilitated generation exercise. So generate ideas, and then uh, do some grouping and narrow it down. And I bet in the end, also you had you had this thing of of themes. Like you could look at questions that are fun or, or well, like what are you doing for fun? What are you doing to relax? Uh, what are you doing for um, like your that you're proud of making right now? Whatever what have you? Or what's frustrating for you right now? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, like, like that's a whole pile of constraints you can pick and choose from, mm -hmm. and you know, run that through a method for two minutes of well, you're going to get lots of ideas. Yeah, and I I just think that's kind of silly that I I'm feeling I really do well with those kind of framings. Well, yeah. no, I, I was reminded of the fact that when I was talking about the postcards, I was reminded of like going back a decade when I taught myself how to use the brush pen. How did I do it? Well, I decided to do a daily sketch. Well, what am I going to sketch? Well, let's make it something that you can draw from memory. It's as easy for you to draw as possible. Do not challenge yourself with what the drawing is. Draw stuff that is that you could draw almost with your eyes closed, right? And so then, then the challenge isn't about drawing. The challenge is about learning how to use the specific tool to do the thing that you're already good at. Right. And so with the postcards, it was like, okay, well, what's the challenge here? The challenge is to try to like send somebody a little bit of thoughtful happiness in two minutes or less. Right. Well, okay, I can do a drawing on it. All right. Time to break out the pencils and the brush pens. Oh, no, don't do that. Because then you're going to labor over it and it's, you're going to run out of time and then you're going to feel like you failed. Okay. Well, let's just break out like the simplest tool I can to make it like whimsical, playful, and manageable. So I feel like those frameworks are almost, I would, I would actually argue that they're, they're absolutely necessary to do a two minute practice. Well, okay. That's good. That helps me. And I feel a little better. Um, oh, good. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, because, because you, you could, uh, I can tell myself what I, what I am telling myself in this, I'm not just, just playing a role of like, I'm going to be the, the one who dropped the ball. Uh, no, goofy really, and galant. I, yeah. Uh, but really the, uh, the two minutes is a constraint that helps, but it really does help if there's a little more something mm -hmm. and, uh, and then like what to do and how in those two minutes and all that. That's one, one of the themes helps. we've been talking about a lot lately, lately is specificity. And so I wonder if like when we pick this week's challenge, we should make it as specific as possible and trust that we'll find ways to hack it. But creating that specific framework will definitely make it, I, I suspect it will make it less of a giant, ambiguous cloud. Uh, and Anna gave me the most marvelous description today of like what it feels like when you're overwhelmed. And she said it's like, it's like being in one of those tubes where they have the fans on and all the dollar bills are flying around. It's like you're trying to catch the dollars, except the dollars are all problems. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, that that's that's one of the best images I've ever heard for what it feels like when you're completely overwhelmed by something. Because um, there's also like the whole, like you're trapped and it's frantic and maybe everybody else is outside going, do it, do it, do it. You're like, no, I can't do it. <laughs> they keep floating out of my hands. 
Oh my gosh. So, um, how do we keep it from being that? Right. <laughs> okay. So now I'm thinking like, what would be, um, okay. Let's go toward relaxing then. Okay. Um, how I like that idea. See. Going toward relaxing something that would be not like being in the little tornado of dollars. <laughs> um, well, okay, so we've done meditation, mm -hmm. um, and we've done art meditation, right? Yes. Um, so in, in meditation, it's about breathing and letting thoughts just flow through you. Art meditation is about just letting the pencil or the pen do what it quote-unquote wants to on the page. You're not trying to create anything. Um, what, if, what if it was something where we're asking people to draw one specific thing as many times as you can in two minutes or less? Something that's simple mm. to draw, something that's easy to draw. Um, and I, and I, I'm immediately thinking of like the Rob Sensinger H people. I, okay. So, or something see. like so, that. Yeah. So, draw a, oh gosh, it's tough. Like, like pick one cartoon character, pick one, I don't know. Could be. Yeah. It could be like, like here's so, a two minute or, Garfield. Or do you like the, the H, but the H ball people is, you think well, so? Well, my thinking is, is more like, because uh, what came to mind was like circles, right? Like draw circles, as many circles as you can in two minutes. But that might seem like kind of a, a futile thing, although it could be kind of a relaxing thing, right? Um, actually, I, I do want to say like just circles, like just draw like circles for two minutes on like a, a sticky notepad. And and add whatever twist that feels right to you, but the main mm. objective is just to just to get circles on a, on a sticky note in two minutes. Circles with a twist that is good. So like you could say, because for me I can I think immediately, um, turn them into demons, mm -hmm. skull little cartoony skulls or, um, or the H ball people right any mm -hmm. of them, uh, yep. but just get those circle based things onto a page. I, I like mm -hmm. that. Okay. You could even do it where it's like the first minute is getting the circles on there. The second minute is turning them into things. But the main idea is to like not fret over trying to create something magnificent. This is about moving the pen for two minutes. Yeah. Move the pen, uh, get the marks on the page. Maybe even this, fill the page, see where, see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Not that you have to fill the whole page. The whole point right. is to just experience to not have the, the pressure. Mm hmm. Hmm. So I would say like that, right. I'm sold that, that okay. I would just was thinking of the guidance of like paying attention to be mindful of if it felt relaxing or not. And if mm -hmm. it didn't, then um, adjust your recipe a little bit. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is circles. That's it. That's, that's, that's the hurdle you got to clear, right? <laughs> okay. And see what we do with it. All right. That sounds great. Thank you, Rob. Oh, thank you, Jersey. So now we're at final thought, close out the show. I think we did a podcast. I think we did. If we open up another final thought, there this would be, this would go on and on because it's a big topic. <laughs> um, All right. right. Well, cool. Well, thank you for this episode, this discussion, Rob. Uh, always good checking in with you. Uh, I hope you and your family stay healthy and safe. Uh, during this weird, weird time we're in right now. Uh, and to you and to all of our listeners as well. I hope everyone is, is, is home and safe. Yeah. Getting their bed. And we will continue to record this show weekly at noon Eastern time, uh, 11 a.m. Central time. We stream it live at twitch.tv slash lean into art. And then we collect that as a podcast at lean into art.com and patreon.com slash lean into art and until next time i have been jersey drozd of lean into art.com and jersey drozd on instagram and i've been rob stenzinger of lean into art.com and i'm rob stenzinger places like instagram okay bye show notes for this episode can be found at lean into art.com you can also follow us on twitter at the user lean into art and you can reach us via email 
at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.